distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I've been here since four o'clock, interacting with the awardees and the organizers, and suddenly it dawned on me that I was invited to make sure that as we engage in geopolitics and geopolitical debates, that my feet were grounded on the ground about the real solution and real people. So I thank Ashton Awards for giving me this opportunity to be here. Five and a half years ago, I volunteered to lead UN Energy, about 20 agencies, including the World Bank, to see how we would place energy access and energy issues central to the development debates that were going on. It was tough to give you an example when the global leaders adopted the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, they didn't talk about energy. We took it for granted. A few years later, suddenly the issue of climate change came up. Ah, oh, we have to save the planet. We didn't talk enough about energy. So as I led UN Energy, a few friends and others said, why don't you talk to your boss? He's put his political capital up behind climate change but he's not talking enough of energy. So I give credit also to my friends at UN Foundation. So we set up a group and we approached the Secretary General, and of course, sometimes in these systems, when you give a good idea, they say, do you want to lead it? <laughs> energy issues are very sensitive. There's a lot of national interests. There's a lot of lobbies, powerful men and women who like the status quo. The reality is 60 to 70 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions come from energy generation, transport, heating and cooling buildings, industry, agriculture, and so on. You cannot, you cannot solve climate change without an energy revolution. It is also true, as you've seen in the videos from the rest of the world, that without access to energy, the Millennium Development Goals cannot be achieved. That's the campaign we lead. You might ask yourself, why this guy? Well, I was born in Sierra Leone. For most of the 90s, we hugged the bottom of the Human Development Index, the poorest country in the world. But for you in Britain, you might say, wait a minute, isn't that the country where in the 1800s we used to call the Athens of Africa, where we established the first premier university for West Africa? Yes, it was. But yes, you know what happened to us in the 90s, the wars we had. But yes, even in 2008, we were at the bottom of the Human Development Index. But you know why in 2008? Because we had the highest level of in infant mortality and maternal births, maternal deaths when women deliver children. Those two indices put us down. So why the Ashton Awards? It's about probably four reasons. The Ashton Awards this evening, as you saw, integrated energy access or energy security, food security, and water security. For poor people, it's about life and death. You're talking about 1.3 billion people who have zero access to electricity. You're talking about 2.7 billion people, almost one third of mankind, that rely on cow dung and biomass for their primary energy needs. This results in almost two million deaths a year, much more than malaria and HIV AIDS. And the International Energy Agency projects that by 2030 that number goes up. You'll be surprised, 587 million energy poor in Africa, 350 to 400 million in India. Energy poverty is real. So today's event is that nexus, that connection between energy security water security and food security. Second, it's about possibilities. When you deal in geopolitics, you are in New York, and UK representative has to defend national interests. The Americans have to do the same. The Chinese have to do the same. It's difficult to transact energy issues. Very sensitive. Ah, then you talk about green energy. How, how should we talk about green energy when others have industrialized for 150 years, 200 years polluting, and suddenly we have to be clean? How do you convince the others? How do you convince the Africans responsible for only less than 3% of global emissions that they should be green? But they financed the first industrial revolution. 
They were under colonial governments. Now they should leapfrog and be green when others have enjoyed cheap energy, polluting energy, and transform their economies and become industrialized. The truth is, they have to. It's about poverty reduction. It's about women empowerment. But you know something? It is also the reality that if business as usual continues on the climate change, the poorest of the poor suffer. Africa loses 50% of the yields of their crops. Bangladesh, Vietnam will lose about 25% of their low-lying areas. As a friend of mine sometimes says, everybody will have a room in climate hell. The Ashlin Awards is also, and meanwhile, here we see solutions are available. The Ashton Awards are also about partnerships. If the UK is green and the rest of us are not green, net effect, zero. We'll still hit four degrees and we'll all perish. Has to reach across the world. Some of you have solutions. Some of you have finance. You've got to help the rest of the world access that. You know, in the next 20 years, 45 to 50% increase in energy demand, most of it. 70% of it is from developing countries. If you don't share technologies, if it cannot be financed, so they deploy good technologies, yes, climate change with Watson. The last statement, the Ashton Awards is about business models. I was very pleased to see the last award went to an entity that was looking at microfinance. With all the good intentions in the world, the speed and scale of interventions we need today to stay in two degrees, to ensure that growth is inclusive, that we lift the rest of the world out of poverty. You need scale and speed. The solutions are in the private sector. The finance is in the private sector. Charity has a limit. Charity can leverage. Char charity can demonstrate proof of concept. But the scale of development or deployment has to be based on a, a business model that gives confidence to the private sector to say, fine, I'll do business here, save the world, and make money. Charity has its limits. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for inviting me. I hope that you'll join our campaign for sustainable energy for all. To declare 2012 the year of sustainable energy for all meant weekends that some of us had to forego. To put that in the political discourse, to get the General Assembly to accept that energy you cannot take for granted. And finally, you will not have global peace and security if people don't have economic opportunity. You cannot fight poverty without creating wealth. Nowhere. You cannot come to Africa and source raw, ma raw materials the same way we did it in the 16th, 17th century. Africa's population will be 1.3 billion by 2030. 2 billion by 2050. What will our children do? That's why I brought my daughter here. They need economic opportunity, not charity alone. They need to trade. They need to do business. When people lack opportunity, they do bad things. When, when nations fail, terrorism comes in, as we see in Somalia, as we see in other parts. Finally, Mrs. Gandhi said in 1972, the first Stockholm conference, is in poverty the biggest polluter? Are the people in Cambodia or Bangladesh cutting down the trees because they're ignorant, partly, but it's because they're poor. They have no alternatives. Let's create an inclusive world where there's prosperity for all, so your children or grandchildren and mine can enjoy the same prosperity. Thank you very much.